disease. Uh, so, but gas means different to different people, and everything is gas in India. So that is what I was trying to put it out here. So all these, there may be just burping, there may be bloating, farting, and even a migraine, and sometimes even myalgia, which is often recognized as gas in different people. So spend some time, try to find out what they actually mean by gas. So by doing so, we may be able to rationalize the therapy and avoid unnecessary treatment. So avoid prescription prescribing PPI without inquiry or investigation, spend some time, looks for features of anxiety, depressive features, look at bowel habits, reflex features, sometimes vitamin B deficiency is a very common cause for farting, vitamin D deficiency which is very rampant in India, may be a common and easily correctable cause for all these myalgia, scatches, so preventing it. And never use uh, PPI with 30 mg domperidone in twice a day dose. This is something that we normally see. Uh, upper ceiling limit of domperidone is just 30 mg. If you want to use domperidone on a twice a day or basis, always go for a combination which has only 10 mg. So generally, they are those which don't have SR written in them or DSR, SR, something like that. And uh, Levosulfuride is another propanetic which has a lot of side effects. It can produce tremors, rigidity, extra periodical symptoms. It can produce uh, start, uh, lactation in women. It can produce erectile dysfunction in men. So that is something which required use only acutely for a short period of time. So next is abdominal pain. Interpreting abdominal pain is very easy if you understand the embryology of abdominal pain. So we have a foreguard which is after the uh, ampulla, then you are sometimes even up to the DJ fracture, then you have the mid gut which goes up to the distal half of the transverse colon and then the hind gut. So if you understand it, you have know the areas where they cause pain. So foregut pain is generally above, mid gut pain is around the navel and hind gut pain is below the navel. Next, you need to see what is the type of pain, whether it is a burning pain, whether it is a colic or whether it is a boric. Generally, these are the three major types of pain. So, burning pain generally means reflux or peptic ulcer disease in the foregut part. Colic is generally biliary, boring or a uh, stabbing kind of a pain is generally ulcer disease or pancreatitis. If you look at the mid gut, it will be, if you have somebody saying neuro or you have burning pain, it is generally neuropathy. Most of them are diabetic, you have autonomic neuropathy. Then if it is colic, then you have to look at intestinal. In intestinal, midgut is generally small bowel. It can be uretric. If it is boring, then you look at intestinal ischemia, mesenteric infarct and peritonitis. Similarly, in the hindgut, uropathic, if it is burning, colic is intestinal, which is generally colon unit is in the hindgut, uretric may be there, intestinal ischemia, mesenteric infarct and appendicitis epiploica. So very simple to down uh, to uh, narrow the diagnosis and then order your investigation. So if you go by the quadrants, then you have a little more extensive part, but if you can look at the uh, embryological representation, then it is quite easy. So in investigation, if you are thinking of biliary or uretric appendicitis, right upper quadrant or a costovertebral angle pains, ultrasound is an investigation. Don't do ultrasound for an intestinal colic. Don't do ultrasound when a person presents with dyspeptic symptoms or an ultrasound when somebody presents with obstructive features because it is not going to tell much. In those cases, go for a CT. If you already know if there is a stone, there is a high chance of biliary colic or you want to specifically look at intestine or in a form of an enterography, you can choose a MR. So quite simple. You can do an X-ray as a screening procedure, but in today's date, X-ray as a uh, final diagnostic modality has a little uh, significance now. But if you are screening somebody who comes with pain of them, intermittent symptoms, you want to know whether there are obstructive symptoms, whether there is fecal overloading, you can always go on X-ray. Supine X-ray is sufficient in majority of the cases because you get to know the size of the bubble better in a supine X-ray. Uh, erect X-ray you do when you are specifically looking for obstruction. Now, avoid anti-motility drugs. We see that anybody comes with pain gets a muscopan. So generally avoid anti-motility drugs till you make a diagnosis. You can use paracetamol. Paracetamol 1 gram infusion has good uh, efficacy even against uh, visceral kinds of pain. PPI can have a placebo effect. Generally anybody who comes to the emergency, comes to the hospital, gets a PPI and they are happy. And, but uh, getting relief with PPI doesn't necessarily mean an acid peptic disease. Now tramadol may be a better than mescopan or diclofenac in anti-motility whenever there is pain. But do tramadol as an infusion. 
A rapid push of tramadol can cause too much vomiting and retching. Intermittent pain may require sometimes investigation during the time of pain. It may be in terms volvulus where there is twisting, where intersusception, where the intestines are going into one another, or a sphincter of a dysfunction. So next is uh, diarrhea. So any change in consistency or frequency of stool is considered towards the lower side and a higher uh, frequency is considered diarrhea. Generally, it is considered anything more than 200. This is mainly for Western standards. In Indian standards, you generally take it as more than 400 grams. But whenever somebody comes for diarrhea, look out for volume and frequency. Whether it is a large volume or a uh, small volume, whether it is a walking diarrhea. Walking diarrhea is three to four stools per day, which doesn't interfere with their life, or it is where you get incapacitated. You get five to six stools. You cannot go out. Normally, large volume stools are generally small bowel. Large bowel uh, stool uh, diarrheas are generally small volume diarrheas. Similarly, frequency is much higher uh, in case of uh, small bowel diarrhea or if it involves the rectus sigma. Or in between, it may be a small volume. Look at evacuation issues. I'll come back to that. Look at abdominal and anorectal symptoms, abdominal pain and location of pain. Again, if you point whether it is small bowel or large bowel. Look at presence of fever or systemic inflammation. Look whether there is vomiting and look for signs of dehydration. This will help you plan your treatment. Now, if there is tenismus, tenismus means a constant urge to pass stools. If there is blood and mucus in stools, small volume stools, generally it means rectosigmoid stools, a distal source. However, if you have large volume water diarrhea, generally they are small bottle, uh, small bubble source. Then if you have nocturnal awakening, somebody gets up in the middle of night to pass motion, somebody has blood in stool, somebody has fever, somebody is dehydrated, this generally indicates that this is a very significant kind of affliction. Look for signs of pseudo diarrhea, where a person is anxious, the person has pelvic floor dysfunction. People generally go to do multiple times with ineffective evacuation. These are not diarrhea. You should not treat them as diarrhea because that would worsen the situation. Avoid antibiotics in acute diarrhea. Acute one day, two day diarrhea, where there is watery diarrhea, without fever, without much abdominal pain, antibiotics have no role. They are either toxin mediated or viral mediated. Even toxin and viral can't have fever, so avoid diarrhea. Metronidazole groups are only in case of walking diarrhea. That is when somebody has three, four stools per day, some mucus in the stool, some lower abdominal cramps, which is going on for days together, weeks together. There only there is an indication for metronidazole. So don't use metronidazole for other things. Use ORS as indicated wherever there are signs of volume depletion. Zinc is a very essential element in improvement of intestinal health. Avoid milk and encourage curd. Milk is metabolized by enzyme lactase. Now lactase is a very deficient enzyme in majority of us attached to the intestinal mucosa. So whenever there is intestinal mucosal uh, abnormality, you lose lactase and generally you develop secondary lactose intolerance. So and that itself causes a lot of bloating, farting, increase in stools, discomfort. So this alone would uh, bring a lot of difference to the person. Use of probiotics, there is no hard evidence against it, but they may not cause any problems, may be helpful in children, but no hard evidence. And again, avoid antimotility drugs. Antimotility drugs like lopramide are only when the person is fully incapacitated, cannot walk around, cannot go, too much dehydration, unable to control. And I would prefer using octodide, which is an anti-secretary agent, if, we, if given a choice. And don't use the term IBS lightly because IBS is a very difficult diagnosis to make if you ask me and it is generally a diagnosis of exclusion. And our patients are very happy to cling to a diagnosis. If you, if a person comes, he says, I have IBS, I ask what is IBS, he says irritable bowel syndrome. So that is something that we should look at. Similarly, constipation is reduced stool volume, frequency or altered consistency. Generally look at the personal habits because constipation differs for different people. A person passing three or stools once in two days may be happy, may not feel anything. So look at the consistency. Look at the age of onset. If there is stool, uh, stooling disorders from a long time, generally it doesn't make any generally, generally indicate, doesn't indicate any significant disease. However, if it is onset from childhood, you should also think of Hirschfeld's disease. If it is onset from the time the child was uh, trained, toilet trained, then you have to look at uh, uh, bad toilet habits, then you have to look at whether there is any sudden change in the stooling. That generally indicates a very significant disease which needs uh, evaluation. Again, you have to look at slow transit versus pelvic floor. Slow transit is the person that doesn't feel an urge. 
generally they don't have an urge to pass tools. Look at the diet, look at drugs. There are a list of drugs which can cause constipation. And uh, PR is generally indicated when somebody is above the age of 50. Sorry, there is a sudden change in the characteristics of the stool. Or there are perennial symptoms and pelvic floor dysfunction. So what is pelvic floor dysfunction? Person characteristically comes and says, I am unable to evacuate. I feel stool is stuck in me and it is not coming out. They feel the urge but they cannot pass. They also come with history saying that they sometimes have to put a finger or sometimes they have to support the perineum to pass the motion. They usually claim more visits to the loo and they said they spend a lot of time in the loo and they claim it as diarrhea. They come with history saying that they have diarrhea. So recognize this, this is not diarrhea but this is constipation actually. This may be associated with blood and mucus especially when there is something called a salt rectal ulcer or hemorrhoids or fissure with it and this needs to be managed with biofeedback. Biofeedback is a type of way, uh, treatment where we teach them how to improve the muscle coordination, improve the evacuation. This is an anorectal, uh, anorectal manometry graph showing different types of uh, pelvic floor dysfunction. So as I said, IBS needs a strict criteria and these criteria have to be present on a sufficient period of time to make a diagnosis. But the basic premise is the person should have abdominal pain or discomfort which is related to the act of stooling. Person has pain before stooling, person feels better after stooling. That is the basic uh, premise on which you make a diagnosis of IBS and there should not be any explainable organic cause for this symptoms and this should be present for at least last three months on a, and uh, within the last uh, six months prior to the diagnosis. So before you label somebody as IBS, it is better to look at vitamin B12 deficiency, celiac disease especially if they are from North India, diabetic diarrhea is one more thing that is generally confused for IBS and then anxiety or spurious uh, diarrhea. So what are the red flag signs when somebody says they have IBS? Look at signs and symptoms of GIP, unexplained iron deficiency anemia, unexplained weight loss, palpable abdominal mass or uh, lymph node, family history of colonic cancer, onset after the age of 50 and sudden or acute change in symptoms. These are some things that you should recognize that this is not a garden variety of IBS and you need to look at it. So when you try to do a stool, these are the things that you generally look at. Look at pus cells. These generally indicate that there is a disruption in mucosa. Up to 5 pus cells are normal. Anything above 5 is abnormal. RBCs, if there is visible blood in your stool, there is a column called blood also in the stool, then it generally indicates an anorectal source unless it is a rapid source of bleed. It may also indicate a higher source when there is no visible blood. Now, OVA, trophocyte and segments indicate active infestation. However, if there is only cyst, cyst may indicate only colonization. So you get a lot of amoebic cysts. You don't need to treat them. It only indicates colonization. Now, you have to look at fat globules, but generally presence of fat globules doesn't mean anything. You have to look at the size and the number of fat globules, which may indicate presence of fat malabsorption. Reducing substance, if it is there, generally it indicates lactose intolerance. Presence of bacteria and fungi has no significance in stool. Almost 80-90% of the stool is made of bacteria. So, we see people coming in panic with saying that there are so many bacteria in the stools. So, it generally means no significance. And in majority of the cases, stool culture doesn't make any sense. It is only when you are trying to look for some uh, entry bacteria like salmonella growth, only that is when it makes a difference. So next is blood in the stools. Now blood in the stools can be because of various sources, but not all blood or hemorrhoidal or fissure. You have to look at rectal ulcers, rectal polyps, inflammatory bowel disease, malignancy, infective colitis and hematochesia. So, whenever somebody presents, it is always better to look at blood with stools versus bloody stools. They are two different things. You have normal colored stools with blood, that is blood with stools. You have the whole stool which is mixed with blood, that is bloody stools. Also, as for painful defecation, stool consistency, again, anorectal pointers are painful defecation, straining, blood with stools, multiple small volume defecation, tenismus and mucus. Whenever there is weight, fever, weight loss, soft stools and abdominal pain along with blood, these are something that has to be taken seriously. Now when do you suspect upper GI bleed when you see blood in the stools? When there is hemodynamic compromise. Normally, anorectal blood bleeding never causes hemodynamic compromise. There is no hypertension and all. Significant anemia also generally suggests an upper GI source unless the lower GI bleeding has been occurring for quite some time. Mid or upper abdominal pain, raised media with normal creatinine. 
This is because of the breakdown of the RBCs and then absorption of urea and presence of barbobemi. If somebody comes with a bleeding stools and you put a strep on the abdomen and you feel a lot of bowel sounds, it generally indicates a upper GI scores because stomach is an irritant to the intestine and intestine grumbles. Now, I'm just taking a couple of other things. How do we interpret CVC? Look at hemoglobin, high hemoglobin, low hemoglobin. High hemoglobin with a high fat cell volume, which is generally polycythemia. Look at whether it is primary or secondary. Low BCV, generally look at blood loss. Then the other pointers are high urea or high uric acid. Now when you come to low hemoglobin, look at whether it is low MCV or a high MCV. Now you low hemoglobin with low MCV, look at the red cell distribution width or the Menzies index. If it is less than 13 and you have a normal platelet count, you should think about thalassemia and look at HP electrophoresis. If you have a high platelet count, then look whether it is a high ferritin. If there is a low hemoglobin, high platelet count, high ferritin, look at anemia of chronic disease. Look for markers of inflammation. If you have high platelet count, with normal ferritin and switches of iron deficiency, then look at stool local blood, stool protein, gall protectin. In appropriate cases, look for CDR Now, in I think the slide is cut, I'm sorry. When there is a high red I am sorry, this has to be like this. So, look at this. Now, when you have a low hemoglobin and a high MCV, again look at platelets. If there are low platelets with increased red cell distribution rate, then you look at myelodysplastic syndrome, alcoholic liver disease and cirrhosis. We have bone marrow biopsy and an ultrasound. If there is a normal red cell distribution rate, then look at vitamin B12 and folic acid deficiency. Then may you look at all of the malabsorption markers. I think this has already been said. These are the platelet clumps. Whenever there is platelet clumps, don't worry. These are generally just reactive changes. Again, with splenomegaly, without splenomegaly, you have a lot of things. Now, low platelet count is a very sensitive indicator for portal hypertension. So, if you have a normal platelet count, generally it indicates that there is no significant portal hypertension. Then, race player WBC counts, you can look at specific uh, parameters which are involved, specific cells that are increased. Then, when we look at creatinine, if there is an elevated creatinine, then see whether it is raised out of proportion. Then you have dehydration, renal failure and upper GI bleed with tumor lysis syndrome. If it is elevated with urea, then you look at intrinsic renal failure. If you have a low creatinine, generally it indicates malnutrition or a low muscle mass. Sodium again, low sodium and a high sodium. Just look if there are signs of dehydration and a high low chloride with urea it is dehydration, just give NS. Don't try to give high sodium. If there is edema, it usually indicates dilutional. If there is high potassium, then it indicates generally diuretic use or a cortisol deficiency. If there is a high sodium, again you have to look at whether there is edema or whether there is volume depletion. Depending on that, you can try and make a diagnosis. Potassium is one more. Generally low potassium, you have to look at whether it is alkalosis or alkalosis. Based on that, you can make high potassium can be sometimes pseudo because of hemolysis. It can be true, which can be because of tumor lysis, renal failure and beta blockers. These I have just put up because these are some things that we generally see and if you can look out at some small pointers, it will be very easy to narrow down the diagnosis. In urine protein, I am stepping into another area, where RBCs without blood may indicate kidney or glomerular involvement. If it is blood, it may indicate lower urinary involvement. And the pus cells more than 5 generally indicate an urinary infection, may need cultures. If there is protein or albumin, it may be significant if there is no coexistent infection. Casts are generally significant. Again, bacteria per se without uh, pus cells in the absence of antibiotic may not indicate anything. Fungi may generally indicate prolonged catheterization but may also be found after antibiotic use. So, coming back to our core area, jaundice. So, whenever there is jaundice, we have to differentiate between hyperbilirubinemia with jaundice. Now, hyperbilirubinemia is just increase in bilirubin. Jaundice is a clinical symptom. Again, we also have to look at hepatitis. Hepatitis is just elevation of SGOT and SGPT without jaundice or bilirubin. When the indirect bilirubin is more than 85% of the total bilirubin, you call it as indirect hyperbilirubinemia. When the direct bilirubin is more than 50% of the total bilirubin, you call it as direct hyperbilirubin. So, whenever somebody is jaundice, first see whether it is direct or indirect. If it is indirect, look whether there are low platelets, 
high LTH, they generally lead to a deficiency. If it is a lapse of normal, you can think about Gilbert syndrome. This is one diagnosis which generally people don't get and they run around uh, because they are worried that they have a liver If there is phenomegaly, high rate count and a reduced hyperglobulin, generally it is hemolysis. So when you have predominantly direct, you have to look at which is the predominant abnormality, whether it is SGOT or alkaline phosphatase. When you try to do that, it is always better to look at number of times normal because different labs have different normal values. So you look it at three times the upper limit of normal, two times the upper limit of normal. So when motivity is more than alkaline phosphatase, you look at primary liver related causes. Rarely very high OTPT with alkaline phosphatase can occur when the stone gate comes down and gets stuck at the papilla. When alkaline phosphatase is much higher, you look at uh, obstructive causes, sometimes you also look at sepsis, malignancy and intrahepatic uh, cholestasis. So as I said, whenever there is jaundice, look whether the features of anemia, rule out Gilbert, vitamin B12, this is called prehepatic when it is predominantly because of hemolysis, hepatic when there are causes directly related to the liver, sometimes may be caused with jaundice, generally it causes yellow eyes. Then you can have greenish yellow eyes in post hepatic causes. Now, post hepatic and hepatic generally you do ultrasound as the first imaging modality. In pattern recognition, you should see if there are, as I said, upper limit of normal. If it is very high, you look at viral hepatitis, drug, ischemic, acute biliary obstruction, acute butt carrier Wilson. If there are around 5 to 10 times the upper limit of normal, you look at your garden variety, typhoid, dengue, COVID, drugs, Wilson, and this. And if it is predominantly mild elevation, then you look at alcohol, NASH, chronic hepatitis, again the general infections. So this is one slide that I wanted to put. Generally when there is an affection of the liver, the first thing to come is the symptoms. Next thing to go up is the SGOTPT, then the bilirubin rises, then the alkaline phosphatase rises. So why I have I put up is, when you follow a person, you would see that OTPT are coming down, but still bilirubin and alkaline phosphatase are going down. So this is not much to worry, this is the general trend. If an otherwise the person is normal, PTINR is holding, you could generally wait because that would probably indicate a recovering liver. So again in albumin, as a part of LFT, if it is reduced, see how are the globulins. If the globulins are normal or reduced, this is important. You find sometimes hypoproteinemia and low albumin and low globulin, then you have to look at all these. If there is an increased globulin, look at chronic liver disease and myeloma, sometimes sepsis. What is increased albumin? It is generally dehydration. So recognizing this also helps. Now this is also something that I wanted to just put a slide on because it is something that you frequently see. You find somebody is HPSAG positive, look at LFT, PTNR, CBC, ultrasound, abdominal and pelvis. Up, look at HPE and anti-HPV. Earlier they were considered as markers of replication. Now they are recognized as two independent types of hepatitis B. It is like class and subclass. Once you have decided there is an active problem going on because of hepatitis C, then you do the DNA. Because DNA is primarily involved as a prognostic indicator, primarily as a follow-up for your patient on treatment. Don't order DNA right at the diagnosis of hepatitis B. Then maybe an endoscopy is required and these are required on follow-up on a regular basis. So again if you see acute infection, if you want to test, it has to be HBCG and anti-HBC, chronic again anti-HBC total and HBCG, type of the disease as I said subtype, then correlation with long term sequelae is DNA and liver function and these are the follow-ups. So this would make evaluation rather straightforward. One more thing I wanted to tell, this is, this is how people come with the report, they see this value and they are very afraid. They see, oh, I have such a high value. This value has got no relation with the amount of infection or the severity of infection. It is a comparative way to look at in the chemoemulsions technique. So in jaundice, avoid restrictive diets. Don't put them on too much restrictive diet. The present thinking is high protein, high calorie diet is what is essential for recovery from hepatitis. So don't put them on restricted diets. Need to maintain blood sugar and muscle mass. Muscle is the second liver of the body. Maintain the muscle mass. Half of the things are done. Encourage high protein, high calorie diet. This Lola and Hepamers people use should be used only in, in cephalopathy. Leave 52. We don't see a role. Maybe two people have something. You should let me know. Avoid constipation. 
Parastamol overdose, herbal life and some of these have also been associated with liver failure. This is something that we should know. Now these are, I have just put up a few procedures that we do at uh, Sparsh. Now this is a denture that was removed. This is a large polyp with a big mass where we could put a uh, uh, loop around it to cut down the blood supply and then remove it. This is a capsule endoscopy. This is the size of a routine vitamin capsule. This has a camera, transmitter and everything which can uh, move through your uh, intestine, take pictures, send it to your receiver which you can plug it outside and look at it. So this is the loop that is being applied. This is called as a double balloon enteroscope. There is a large enteroscope where you uh, go down the intestine, bleed the intestine up, you can go down, do some therapeutic procedures where there are strictures, narrowings and all. So some of the things that were only possible surgically can now be done through endoscopy. Now again, this is one uh, large stone that is being removed here. This is an endoscopic ultrasound where there is an ultrasound mounted on the endoscope. This is just like your transesophageal you're echo, you are looking at the four results of the heart. This is the liver, this is the stone in the portal, uh, in the CBD. Uh, this is uh, a spy scopy where you put a scope directly into the bile duct, take a laser, and this is a large stone in the bile duct which you can blast it. This is a large stone which we uh, removed in a normal way. You can see the stone being delivered out. And the second one is, uh, the last one is a Pseudocyst. This is a large pancreatic fluid collection inside. You can see the debris inside. You can see through this uh, similar kind of an uh, endoscopic ultrasound, we puncture this under its guidance and put a catheter between the stomach and the pseudocyst to drain the pseudocyst. So again, these are some of the things which were done surgically. Now, the, you can see the wire going inside. This is the uh, echo that is being the, uh, the echo of the wire that you are seeing here. This is a, in case of cholangiocarcinoma, that uh, spy bite we are taking, we are taking biopsy from within the uh, CBD to give a definitive diagnosis. Now, this is one of the endoscopic bariatric procedures where we place a balloon within the stomach to produce a sense of uh, satiety. And uh, this is a pH impedance metry where we have probes which are placed in the esophagus to measure reflux which may be either acidic or non-acidic. So we can quantify and let it know. And this is the manometry, this is the esophageal manometry which uh, we use to measure esophageal movements especially in people with uh, swelling disorders and aglaze. You can see the balloon placed in the fundus of the stomach. Uh, this is one of those aglaisia patients. This is the esophageal lumen. You enter into the wall of the esophagus, make a tunnel in the esophagus. This is not esophageal lumen, this is a tunnel in the esophageal lumen. You can see the bulge because of the tunnel outside. Sorry. You can see the bulge here because of the tunnel. Then you cut the muzzle in the tunnel and open up the muzzle and then close this opening. So this is an endoscopic uh, uh, technique of treating aglaisia cardia. What was done surgically from outside, we are also able to do it endoscopically from inside. So this is just a last video I have put up. So our intestines are not ours. There are a lot of other things which can reside in our intestine. The first one is the flu, liver flu. The second one is the hookworm. You can see the blood in the lumen of the intestine. That is how we generally recognize a hookworm and this is a pinworm in the colon. So if you don't have a take care of your personal and food hygiene, you can have a lot of other macroscopic things uh, living in your intestines also. See, you can see this is the liver fluke. You can see the suckers uh, coming out in a minute or so. You can see the movement of the so there were a set of two flukes. Generally they are rare in India, but you sometimes uh, see in uh, some of these international patients uh, who come down. So this is a facial this is a liver fluke. So we experts are a big comprehensive team. So I have two of my colleagues here. 
Ishwar uh, is here and we have our uh, Shivanand also here and we have our surgical colleagues also. Please come. So.